Good evening. Dear friends, it is an honor to bring you greetings on behalf of the borough of Phoenixville and welcome you to the historic Colonial Theater as we gather together to recognize and reflect on the state of the 6th Congressional District and ceremonially swear in our extraordinary Congresswoman, Chrissy Houlihan. We feel so very fortunate that you have joined us here in Phoenixville. As a community, Phoenixville is mindful that we owe our existence and vitality to generations of people from all abilities, geographies, and walks of life who have contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to shaping our shared home. For generations, Phoenixville's residents have produced the iron and steel that have held up our country's greatest monuments and the world's bridges. Today, our strength is no longer measured in steel or in size, but instead, the hope that we share with the world, a hope that all people will find a place to be safe, celebrated, and loved. Please join me in welcoming Chester County Court of Common Pleas Judge, the Honorable Annalisa Sondergaard. Chester County for almost 20 years with my husband and two sons who now attend Westchester University and Temple University. It is a privilege to be here with all of you tonight as a public servant and as a fellow constituent. Two years ago in January 2021 I had the honor of conducting the same ceremony with Representative Houlihan. While the words are the same the atmosphere is distinctly different Two years ago, the ceremony was virtual. It was on Zoom. It had to be because of COVID. But now I see you all here in person and I have to say, it's very good to see you all here. Representative Houlihan, would you please join me on stage? Support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will solemnly support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. Of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> It's always, uh, it just makes me so um, excited to have the opportunity to do that in front of my own community rather than down in Washington. As, as meaningful as it is in Washington, it's nice to be able to echo that again here in our area. And so if it's all right with you guys, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna, you've obviously already seen our agenda. And for some of you all who have been here before in or in situations such as this, this is one of our, I think we've done six dozen or more town halls at this point in time. But one of the things that we do uh, before we begin a town hall, and in this case, our State of the Union, is we do something that I kind of take out of the teacher teaching profession. So for those of you guys who are teachers, you can 
probably remember the fact that you want to make sure that you have really good classroom management skills and that you really have a, people who all understand the same norms who are in the classroom together, who are here to learn from one another and to listen. And so these are some of the norms that we have had in the past and that we'll continue to have into this meeting. Mostly because we think that most people just really want to be here to learn and to learn from one another. And so we're asking people when they're here to please treat one another with respect and to leave titles and uh, formalities at the door. That we will use our agenda very, uh, very frugally, that I hope to stay on time. And for that reason, I will tell you that I'm going to be doing a lot more from the book than I normally do. I normally am much more extemporaneous. That if for any reason there is a conflict, that we are thinking about the policy and not the politics and not the person, that we are talking about our differences in opinion and not trying to deride one another. As the last one mentions, we will discuss policy and not, uh, not politics. And that has, for the most part, worked very, very well through the last four years, and I hope to be able to continue to bring these kinds of conversations to all of us by following those, those sets of norms together. The next slide, please. Another thing that we do to try to make sure that we stay on tempo and on schedule is to make sure that when we get questions from all of us, that we process them in a way that allows for us to get to as many questions as possible, because sometimes what we'll discover is there will be a dozen or so questions on one topic, but maybe only one question on another topic. And we want to make sure that we're getting to as many topics as we possibly can. And to that end, you should have, while you came in, gotten a card. And if you didn't, just raise your hand and somebody will bring you a card, which I would ask if you have any questions to please fill out. One question I would ask of you, and I am terrible at this, is legibility. Please make sure that you can read your name and your, uh, and your phone number and contact information. And um, also know that we will be answering as many questions as possible. Uh, the mayor, Mayor Pete, will be organizing them by topics. And if for some reason we are not able to get back to you on the stage today, we will get back to you within 48 hours with some answers to your questions and your, and your comments. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'm going to formally open with some remarks. And here are the remarks. Thank you to everyone who is here this evening and welcome to our State of the Sixth. It is really, really special to be here with you tonight for this presentation. It is the fourth time that I've been able to cumulatively um, update you on the actions that have been taken in, on behalf of our community, both here in Pennsylvania and also in Washington, D.C. It is, and you probably have heard me say this before, really an honor to serve our community as our representative, and I do so with an enormous appreciation of the trust that you place in me for the future as I head into my third term now in Congress. I just now took that oath, an oath to uphold and to defend our country and our Constitution, and I've taken that oath multiple times, first as an ROTC cadet, then as an officer serving in the Air Force, and now I have the opportunity to do that as a member of Congress. Each time I take this solemn oath, an indelible image is imprinted in my mind. I am really grateful for the memories it creates because too often I believe we are forget, forgetful of our own history, and that is to our collective detriment. So without a doubt, as Judge uh, Annalise Sondergaard mentioned, the last few years have produced some intense challenges for us. And re reflecting back all the way back to the 116th Congress, which would have been four years ago, I was first sworn in to the very longest shutdown in our government's history. Then, on January 3rd of 2021, I was then next sworn in while wearing a mask in a nearly vacant House of Representatives due to the raging COVID pandemic. Please remember that that was before vaccines were even available widely, and it was amidst a very dangerous anti-government uh, rhetoric, anti rhetoric and some very serious violence, as you might recall. And most recently, just this couple weeks ago, I raised my hand for the oath of office in Washington, D.C. at 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday, January 7th, after four full days of unsuccessful voting for our next Speaker of the House. So it may seem like the last few years have been really filled with a lot of history, right? A lot of historic frustration, sometimes sadness and anxiety, and sometimes downright hostility. And it may feel like that we're all living our own very terrible version of a timeless children's book. Pay attention here, there will be several references to children's book because, books because I'm really passionate about early childhood literacy. The first one will be Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. 
Sounds like you guys have read it. So I can tell you, and I know that you feel the same way, that there have been many, many days over the last several years where I have felt like Alexander. And there is no doubt that we have challenges all around us. And honestly, that there will be more challenges to come and that there is always work to be done. However, it is really my intention and our hope here tonight that as a community, as a commonwealth, and as a country, we can continue to address those challenges, but address them with pragmatism and with innovation and accountability and with, importantly, a focus on equity and on empathy. One week ago, we collectively honored the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And here's a quote that I really admire of his. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. So what I would say about our state of the sixth, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are moving forward indeed. And I stand before you, hopefully to present to you and say with uh, a, a certain amount of confidence that with all of our branches of government, all of our large and small businesses, all of our educational institutions, our first responders, our nonprofit organizations, our students and our seniors, our families and our workers, across all of our industries, with all of us working together, the state of the sixth is good. So let us begin with the next slide with us. The reason I included this slide is that things have changed a little bit since the last time that I spoke to you all. I wanna make sure that we're grounded and with the same set of facts and data. And so what you're looking at here is two different congressional districts. They're only slightly different than one another. The one on the left is the old Pennsylvania 6th, and the one on the right is the new Pennsylvania 6th as of January. So recall that every 10 years there's a census that is done, and that census takes uh, track, uh, keeps count of every person, uh, every person, not just citizens, and, but non-citizens alike and it calculates a total headcount for our country. And with that accurate headcount, critical resources are sent our way. Funding for roads, bridges, for schools, hospitals, everything in between. What you can see here is that our district stayed largely the same uh, from, time, from uh, decade to decade, which is quite unusual, to be honest. And for those of you who are paying attention, you'll see a small bump out in the slide on the right with a little bit more of Berks County that's included. So we're all of Chester County, we're the lower portion of Berks, and for those of you guys who are in the little bump, if you're here in the audience, welcome, and welcome to the state of the 6th and the 6th Congressional District. Next slide, please. Also to level set with all of us, a little bit of information about the new 6th Congressional District, which I think is interesting and intriguing. I'm also an engineer, so I'm really data-driven, and I really love the information on the slide. In fact, I wish we could stay here longer for you guys to read it. It will be available to you online. Our community, just to sum up a little bit, is by and large a very highly educated community, and we are also very, very hard workers. In fact, only 4.3% of our population is currently unemployed. Another thing that I see here that I wanted to call attention to is in the upper area with key facts. There's a predicted population growth of 0.33%. Chester County particularly is one of just a few counties in the entire Commonwealth that is growing in population. And so that's something that's significant to note. And I'm gonna pause here for just a couple seconds for people to see where people are spending their money. You can see groceries. Um, interestingly enough, you can contrast that to dining out to entertainment, apparel, and healthcare. And those are interesting statistics and some, to some degree are what drives how I think about our community uh, on an aggregate. Next slide, please. The next group that we'll talk about is the County of Berks. So the first one was the County of Chester County, which we're sitting in right now, and the second is Berks County. Some things I wanna call attention to here is the number of households in Berks County that have a disabled person in their home. That number is 23%. So it's a really important reminder that when we talk about equity, which I hope we do today, and we're talking about inclusion, that we are making sure that we are working to expand access to all of our community and all of our people, including those with physical or cognitive disabilities as well. So this is an interesting slide too. 
Berks County is a different county than Chester County. It doesn't share the same amount of uh, affluence in the, in the way that, that Chester County does. Again, the other thing that I call attention to you for is households with um, uh, internet, lack of internet access, with no internet access is 9%, and households at the poverty level or below is 9% as well. I think that that's probably not a coincidence. Next slide. The last time we did the State of the Sixth, I ended with constituent services. And unfortunately, I felt as though I was a little bit too rushed. And this time, we're going to begin with constituent services. We're going to begin here in our community. One of the core functions of our office is helping you, the constituents, navigate the very, very complicated landscape of federal government, of our benefits, of our contracts, of our permits, et cetera. Each congressional office in the House of Representatives is limited by law to 18 employees in total. For our office, we've decided to have nine in Washington, D.C., and nine here in our community. One up in uh, Reading, an office up in Reading, and an office here in the Westchester area complements the nine people who are here in, in this district. My entire staff, although they're not all here, is focused on delivering results for the people who are in contact with us and who are asking for help. And so in my second term, the one we just ended, we closed 4,045 cases and we delivered back to our community $27 million. And I'll pause there to give you some context. We cost you $1.3 to $1.4 million a year. That's how much taxpayer dollars goes to our 18 employees and to all of the things that, that run our office. We return to us 27 million over the two years. We run this place as a business and we wanna make sure that we're returning on your investment. This graph also represents the past four years and what you'll see here is really important for me to point out because far and away the biggest part of the pie is the IRS. These are the cases that you all call us about and ask for help. The IRS won't answer the phone. The IRS hasn't returned my, my rebate or my refund. I can't, I can't understand what it is that I owe. I, I need help. Important, important when we're listening to the news and we're listening to what's most important to fund, we need help. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases that you all are calling with in the area of the IRS. Second uh, um, lists are the USCIS, which is Citizenship and Immigration Service, which is self-explanatory. The Department of State, many of you have called over the past several years about passport issues. You might recall that those uh, have been struggling as well. CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, so if you have issues with Medicare or Medicaid. SSA, obviously the Social Security Administration. And finally, the VA. We have uh, a lot of veterans in our community and we are grateful for the opportunity to serve them with any of their uh, constituent services. So next slide, please. And again, I'm sorry for kind of reading as quickly as I can or going through this as quickly as I can. We've got so much content. I wanna make sure I can get to it so we can get to questions. As a consequence of all of these constituent services, I'm enormously proud and enormously proud of my team that we have received some really terrific recognition over the past four years. In fact, in the last term, we were the first congressional office ever to receive two awards from the Congressional Management Foundation. And the Congressional Management Foundation is an apartisan organization that selects over four categories, both House and the Senate awards every cycle to acknowledge people and their offices for the work that they've done. We have been awarded in three different categories so far for transparency and accountability, for best workplace environment, which I'm very much uh, excited about, and for constituent services as well. So we take you very, very seriously. So now we're gonna move into some of the nitty gritty that is um, about all of us rather than the individual who calls. We'll start with the uh, small business, the smallest of small businesses. I get to serve on the small business sub, uh, committee, so I'm really grateful for that opportunity. As you can probably imagine over the last several years, being on the small business committee was a lot, given what was going on with COVID. Here are a couple of pictures uh, that I'll d d dive deeper into, but before being on the small business uh, committee, I was also an entrepreneur here in our community. And I started and I helped scale organizations throughout 20 or so years here in Chester County. 
I understand firsthand the challenges that many small business owners and larger and mid-sized business owners are, are enduring, and I'm making sure that we are working hard every day to make sure that we ensure success. One of the best parts of my job is to be able to bring people from Washington here to show them firsthand what's going on in our community. In this picture on my left, my, my right, military right, um, I had an opportunity to, uh, to host Administrator Guzman. She's the administrator of the Small Business Administration. And she was able to come to Coatesville and tour um, a hub of innovation and have a roundtable discussion with leaders. And we focused on things like business leaders who are women and the lack of childcare that is keeping a lot of women out of the workforce. I also got to host Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo, and she's unbelievable at a semiconductor chip manufacturer here in our community as well, Viché uh, Intertechnology, where we were able to discuss domestic manufacturing alongside of, with workforce development. This time our round table was complemented by the administrator from one of our local colleges, community colleges, and by a student who was learning how to be part of this new rapidly dynamic and expanding workforce. Next slide, please. So transitioning slightly, we were first talking about the small business community and now we're moving into the larger economy. Still talking about businesses, but maybe they are different sizes of businesses. Recognizing that one of the biggest challenges that we've had as a collective over the last several years has been supply chains and inflation. Backing all the way up, my degree, my master's degree, and my thesis were on supply chain management. So I love me a good supply chain and I hate it when they don't work. Um, and that's what's happening here. Back four years ago, three years ago, if you had asked any member of Congress what a supply chain was, 434 members of Congress would not have known. 435 members now know, <laughs> and I think it's really important that that's happened. So let's look at some of the things that we've done over the past yeah, couple years to help here. As we look for ways to increase um, the, our efficiencies, I was very grateful that I was asked by House leadership to serve along with my colleagues, both sides of the aisle, and for the House and the Senate, in a conference, remember I'm just a bill, just an ordinary bill, and you gotta have the House, and you gotta have the Senate, and it's gotta come together, and then it goes to the President's desk for signature. That's how it's supposed to work. It's actually not how it works, but it's how it's supposed to work. So I was asked to be on that conference for the Competes Bill, which was about our, our domestic um, supply chains and specifically chips manufacturing. And that was a big honor. What evolved sub subsequently from that is that the Competes Act was renamed, rebranded, we do that in Washington just like we do that in industry and in the, in the Defense Department too, to something called the Chips and Science Act. And I was involved in that legislation as well from the very beginning, working to help secure our supply chains, increasing our domestic production for our semiconductors, promoting opportunities in our science and tech fields, and increasing support for American innovation and manufacturing so that we are less dependent on places like China and places like Russia. That Chips and Science Act was passed by the House, by the Senate, and it was signed into law by the President. Pause. In August, <laughs> it is important, really, I hope, I hope we all see the importance of it. Related, there's another piece of legislation I want to highlight called the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is a general piece of, a generational piece of legislation that gives our country a really long overdue opportunity to invest in clean energy, cleaner energy production, and at usage here at home. So listen again, generational. Some would argue a once every 40 years piece of legislation that allows us to be energy independent, but also allows us to move towards cleaner and more renewable energies. The IRA, which is an unfortunate name for it, provides tax credits for consumers and homeowners, and it greatly supports conservation efforts. Our farming community, and we have a significant farming community here in our area, will benefit tremendously as well from energy conservation and better practices for soil conservation. And additionally, this is why I say it's an unfortunately named bill, it also lowers prescription drug prices considerably to a lot of people, including ma uh, ma a maximum amount for insulin of $35 a month for people who are on Medicare. So that's a big deal. So again, that's what we have. The House, the Senate came together. We voted for it. It went to the President's desk for signature. Remember, the House, 
at that point in time was democratically controlled. The Senate was even Stephen. That meant that we had to have real bipartisanship to be able to make that happen, to go to the White House for signature. And the last thing I'll pause on in this slide is a final bill that uh, I'll talk about briefly. It's called the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It's a better name. It's commonly referred to as IIJA, and it's equally transformational. Our country has fallen behind, significantly behind, on traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels, particularly in places like we are standing that have been here for a while. And that has really cost us. With, without, our upgrading, without upgrading our infrastructure and spending more time and money, uh, we will be making sure that we can guarantee that we'll have issues like I saw with a bakery that I visited uh, in the last couple of years. This bakery here in our community literally has to load its trucks semi-full because it cannot drive over the bridge which is closest to its manufacturing facility full, fully loaded, because it's too heavy at that point in time. So think about the lost opportunities of business, about the energy issues that are, that are there, just about the core business things that are happening in our community if that's the kind of thing that's happening. Also think about what happened with Hurricane Ida where we saw um, historic flooding that we had literally never seen before. I had the opportunity to visit many places, including Phoenixville, that were seeing water in places they had never seen before. The Infrastructure and Jobs Act has significant resources in it to fix these kinds of water issues and also to fix the potability or drinkability of water as well. We'll go over a little bit more on this in just uh, another couple of slides. But I do want to uh, bang on, inf on inflation one more slide because I think it's really important. Supply chains and inflation are issues that we all are suffering with and we are all dealing with. And like many of you, I continue to be concerned about things like rising prices and the burden that that places on everyone, whether students or seniors. So last February, I co-founded the Democratic or New Democratic Congressional Inflation Working Group. So back all the way up, what is that? It's a group of people in Congress, part of a caucus, who said, hey, we've got an issue with inflation, Let's sit down and work on it together. Let's come up with a strategy and a plan, and let's put it out there for the Congress to look at. After meeting with experts on both sides of the aisle, I'm really proud to, to, to tell you that the Inflation Working Group's recommendations are now publicly available, and Forbes magazines called them the best inflation-fighting blueprint that came out of Congress yet. And if you guys have on your little flyers that you might have picked up, I hope you have a QR code little QR code, if you scan the QR code, you can read this report. You can access this report. If you go to our website, it's also up on the banner as well. I also would invite you to read December's Consumer Price Index report as well, because it is showing us hopeful signs that inflation may be moderating, thanks to cheaper fuel and airfares, but we're definitely not out of the woods yet. And different sectors of our economy, such as food prices, continue absolutely to create a strain on our, our economy here in Pennsylvania. So what I would say to you is take a look at that plan, look at the things that that group, our group recommended that happened. Some of them have happened already. In fact, the IIJA is one of those uh, pieces of legislation, but there are many other recommendations that are in that, uh, that particular report that we continue to pursue um, all the different uh, angles that we can on. Next slide, please. Going back to the IIJA, or the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, uh, here's a picture of yet another person from uh, Washington who was able to visit us. And this is President Biden's senior advisor on infrastructure, and his name is Mitch Landrew. To our community, he came to Coatesville, to the train station, to see the revitalization project that's happening there. And as the Infrastructure and Jobs Act rolls out, and it's still pretty nascent in terms of the money reaching us here in our community, but we will be in touch with uh, all of the right people, and I'm looking at you guys in the front row, Senator and Commissioner, <laughs> everybody, to make sure that we are executing on getting us the resources we really deserve. Next slide. To give you guys some perspective, just so you can settle in, we have just settled through 16 slides and we have about 10 more to go. Um, while we've been talking about the importance of small businesses and then larger businesses and the economy and inflation and all of the things that, that um, are stressing us out um, every day, we also have to be talking about the ways that we fix it with the individual people who are here with us. And so I'm going to focus a little bit on education first. Um, 
Our economy cannot happen without talented individuals who are driving that, that economy. And that means that we need to be taking care of the littlest amongst us, the people, the little the babies who are learning um, pre-K skills and life skills, the uh, uh, K through 12 kids, the post uh, high school kids, and the lifelong learners, which I would consider myself to be one. I actually quit my job when I was 45 and went back to school and took chemistry and biology again because I really wanted to, to pivot. And we all do those kinds of things at some point in time. Um, so here are some of the things that we are focused on in Washington. I'm very concerned, as many of you are, about the impact that COVID-19 has had uh, with our global learning loss assess assessment. So there's something that we I introduced uh, in Congress that's called the Global Learning Loss Assessment Act of 2021. So recall that I mentioned I serve on the Small Business Committee. I also serve on the Foreign Affairs and the Armed Services Committee. So through the Foreign Affairs Committee, I was able to introduce this piece of legislation. It was a bipartisan piece of legislation that was called the Global Learning Loss Assessment Act of 2021. And this is to try to understand what the impact has been, not just on us here in the country, in our country, but also across the world in terms of global learning. I also have recognized, and I know many of you guys talk to me about this, the impact that student loan debt has on our community. It's a burden that's carried by a lot of us Americans. But it's important to lead legislation, I believe, that will make common sense reforms to, the, uh, to uh, this kind of issue that people are experiencing. So specifically, I introduced legislation that was targeted to our public service sector, to people who are serving in the, in the jobs we need the most, the teachers, the social workers, the firemen, the police, anybody who's in a, in a service, uh, in a job that helps us um, is, a target, is targeted with this public service loan forgiveness program. Importantly, this program already existed, but almost, I wanna say, uh, less than 10% of the people who applied for the forgiveness were accepted for it. It may even be a worse statistic than that. So this piece of legislation was introduced to make sure that the loan forgiveness that was promised to this sector of people was actually executed on. Next slide. Okay, so that's, that's um, some of education, but that's not all of education. I met some folks in the front who were focused on STEM and STEAM education. Uh, as an engineer, as an entrepreneur, I really care a great deal about STEM and STEAM. And for those who um, don't recall what the initials stand for, it's the science, technology, engineering, and math. But STEAM actually adds art back into that word. And I think that's really, really important because um, being in this theater is an exact testament to that. There is no way to truly separate yourself from the arts. It is really important when you're learning things like STEM skills that you also are integrating that with, with the arts as well. So I've consistently advocated with, for technical training schools here in our area, for community colleges, and for four-year degree institutions to expand academic programs in these fields in particular. I've sponsored legislation called Like the STEM Restart Act, which would help grow our workforce in STEM, and the STEM Diplomacy Act, which, if you can believe this one, in the, in the uh, State Department, there are many jobs, not just some, but many jobs where you cannot be a STEM professional to apply for them. That makes zero sense when we're asking people in our State Department to worry about some of the technical challenges that we're having as a, as a nation and as a world. So this is the STEM Diplomacy Act. <clears throat> These are some of the uh, ideas that have been bouncing around and that we've introduced in the last Congress, some of them have made it past the House, right? Remember, it still has to make it past the Senate. That means that every two years, remembering our Schoolhouse Rock, we reintroduce everything again, and we hope that we're able to pass it in both the House and the Senate and onto the President's desk for signature. So we'll continue to chip away on that. Next slide. This is gonna be a hard transition, guys. We're gonna talk about something called the American Rescue Plan next. Remember we talked about um, three pieces of legislation, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, um, and the IIJA, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Now we're talking about another major piece of legislation that we also passed in the last couple of years that I think really gets a bad rap, and I wanna make sure that we hear, hear from me why that should not be the case. 
It's called the American Rescue Plan, and you see it everywhere in our community. The last time I gave this presentation, I showed you a, a map of Chester County and Berks County, and I showed you where all the PPP loans were. I showed you where all of the first responder um, grants were. Every place that we helped uh, hospitals, every place that we helped um, EMTs. It was astounding. We literally littered the map with dots of resources that came, some of them from the American Rescue Plan, but there were other things that came from the American Rescue Plan here in Chester County. Here's a map of Chester County, and each one of these stars represents an ARPA project. ARPA stands for the American Rescue Plan, and it is the number inside the stars that indicates the number of projects that were brought to each of those places, a town or a borough. So what are these monies that we're getting? They're funding from our federal government, filtered through the state and through our community, through our, um, our, our um, county, for local libraries, for first responders, for community service organizations, like the Phoenixville Area Community Service Area, which I visited two weeks ago, for stormwater upgrades, for more accessible health care, including, and I'll pause here because this is important, millions and millions of dollars that were provided to reestablish emergency care in southern Chester County to the former Jennersville Hospital. So when you think about American Rescue Plan, think here. And I'd like to thank our commissioners, Marion Moskowitz, who's here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge her, Mich Michelle Kickline and Josh Maxwell, for carefully distributing these funds where they are needed the most. And I also see Senator Kamita here as well. Uh, we tried to, very much so. We tried to, Senator, to get the same, same slide for us, for those that came from the state. We'd love to get the same slide so that we can provide it. This one is filtering from the federal government to the county as well. Next slide. Same thing, Berks County, the city of Reading, also received uh, pretty remarkable American Rescue Plans funds too. Reading is our fourth largest city in Pennsylvania, and it is a really big and vital part of our community. You can see a lot of the funds went to Reading. There's 20 in that little, in that um, star, and that of course makes sense. These funds also went to places like health centers, after school enrichment activities for our young people, care for seniors, restoration of our parks and playgrounds, science centers, workforce development programs, like the Reading Area Community College, Alvernia University, and Albright College. So I would like to thank our Berks County Commissioners, Christian Leinbach, Kevin Barnhart, and Michael Rivera, whom I don't think are here this evening, for the Reading City Council and Mayor Moran for also selectively distributing these funds as well. And now transitioning to um, something that I think is, again, back to you know, our, our community directly, our first responders. Also something I think you need to hear and hear from me. President Biden's budget over the last two years, the first two years of his um, term, has in both cases, both times, increased funding significantly for our first responders, as has a lot of other legislations uh, that has been provided. We are, I am absolutely committed to our first responders. I come from a family of service. My dad, my grandfather served in the military, my brother in the, in the army, my cousins are active duty Navy right now. My husband's grandfather was chief of police in the Chicago land area. This is, this is personal to me. So I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to help support President Biden's budget uh, in this area. I'm also very grateful that I've had the opportunity to help introduce another piece of legislation that didn't make it across the finish line this time, that hopefully will next time. It's called the Invest to Protect Act. In this slide, I'm joined by, uh, here in Phoenixville. Uh, where I had the chance to drive along with Sergeant McDonald. And he and they and my drive along inspired me and us and our team to look into legislation regarding something that they mentioned during the ride along, data storage. All of these uh, police uh, groups are getting cool equipment, but if you don't have the place to store the data, it's meaningless. And Big data is real for all of us. And so I appreciate Sergeant McDonald and the Phoenixville Police for helping me understand the need for data and to make sure that we have a legislative plan to support and afford data integrity and data storage. And I want very much to pause right now because I see in the back many of the folks from the Phoenixville Police, especially Chief Brian Marshall uh, in the Colonial Theater who are here tonight. Thank you for protecting us. <laughs> Thank you.
And here's the last extra picture uh, when I got to visit the Phoenixville Fire Department this year. Good looking bunch of people, except for the old lady in the, in the middle. <laughs> We talk about protecting us and we talk about safety and people talk about that a lot to me the safety of our communities we can't not talk about guns we have to talk about the bipartisan safer communities act which i am pleased and proud to say did become law it did get the votes in the house and the senate and it did become law with this president's signature and that was historic as well. I think it was the first time in 28 years that we were able to pass significant safety legislation. So within this legislation, there are common sense gun reforms that can be made to keep our, our, our community safer. There is still a lot of work to be done. And specifically, I'll name a few. I was able to co-sponsor something called Ethan's Law. It was a bill that requires additional gun storage safety measures, uh, particularly when minors are present in the house, and the Protecting Our Kids Act, which prohibits the sale of certain semi-automatic weapons to people under the age of 21. I'll repeat that, certain semi-automatic weapons to people under the age of 21, and increases penalties for illegal gun sales and improves the regulation concerning ghost guns. Importantly, these pieces of legislation will go back into the hopper. I will co-sponsor them again, and I will continue to hope that we are able to get them to the floor for a vote. I would encourage you if this is an issue that's important to you, and I believe it very much is an issue that's important to our community, that you continue not only to call my office, but also your senators um, as well, because this is really, really critical. In November, there, I have a picture here, it, I was able to hold a uh, town hall that was focused on gun safety and, viol and gun, reducing gun violence. And here is the Chester County Intermediate Unit, Executive uh, Director Jared Fiore, uh, Chester County District Attorney Doug Ryan, State Senator Kamita, State Rep Dan Williams, and hundreds of members of our community. And we will make sure that we continue to have this open dialogue. And I really encourage you to continue to talk to my office about this. As I mentioned, military, but also an educator. I stood in classrooms at high school, I taught high school chemistry where I had to walk in and out of metal detectors and all my students did too, and yet we still ended up with guns in the classroom. Um, and so I would love very much to continue to advocate for this issue with you. Next slide. Speaking of advocating for people, all of families were condensed to one slide. So hopefully I'll be able to, to rattle this thing through. I'm trying to highlight here within this slide what we're doing in our office to fight for families. And here are three anecdotes of that. One is infant formula. Y'all don't have to think very far back to remember we were really in crisis and frankly still haven't come out of it completely when the Abbott Baby Formula Facility in Sturgis, Michigan shut down. Millions of parents were left, as you recall, scrambling to figure out how to feed their infants. And we in our office took action to secure federal funding for an infant formula manufacturer plant that had literally just opened in our district. It was the fifth out of five um, that were certified um, through the FDA to be able to produce infant formula. So we worked really hard to accelerate the timeline for them to be able to produce and manufacture. Uh, infant formula. I also had the opportunity to introduce something called Accessing Donor Milk Act of 2022. It's a weird conversation to be having with you guys here on a stage talking about donor milk, but it's actually a really important way that we have to make sure that all children are able to be fed. And there is a significant economy of donor milk that we want to make sure is safe and accessible to all people. Next, the women's right to choose. Um, I will unapologetically say that I voted to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, which would legally guarantee a woman's right to choose. And I'll continue to do that, and I'll continue to talk about these really hard uh, issues that impact and devastate uh, the health of our, of our um, families and our, our women um, and our futures, our collective economy and future. And finally, the last thing on fighting for our families, the equality and, um, and equity uh, issues. In 2023, we are still fighting and still working to ensure that there is equality for all Pennsylvanians. And that has to be regardless of gender identity, regardless of race, ethnicity, disability, background, or sexual orientation. So I'm really proud, again, 
again that we were able to pass, again, House, Senate, and the President, the Respect for Marriage Act that makes sure that same-sex couples have the same access to and benefits of marriage, the same ones that their straight counterparts do, and that the George Floyd and Justice and Policing Act, I hope will have the opportunity to also pass in a similar fashion. What I'm trying to say in this last piece is that the road to equity and equality is very long, and I will remain uh, committed to pursuing policies that will address and remedy these situations. But I also will continue to do what I do in all of the areas, which is a half a loaf is better than none. Half, I want to emphasize that. Many of the things we've talked about in the last nearly hour, I have three more minutes to go before questions. Um, I hope what you're hearing is pragmatism. I hope what you're hearing is that I'm working across the aisle, that I'm working hopefully to find legislative um, initiatives that will solve problems and are pragmatic and practical solutions. I hope what you're hearing is that we're working within our community um, with our constituents to make sure that we're addressing their issues. I know our federal systems sometimes are frustrating, uh, but it's our privilege and our job to help uh, ease that frustration. We'll move on to the last part, um, which is something that I think is really important for people to also hear. Um, it's something called community funding or community project funding. And we have a lot of stakeholders here in the audience tonight. I'm gonna call, shout you out in just a second. In 2022, my office and this community participated in a, an appropriations process that's now called community project funding. So previously, this funding was referred to as very derogatorily as earmarks. So you may have heard this referred to before. And you may associate it with wasteful spending and it disappeared for some time. Well, it was back, brought back two years ago, and in 2021, the process was revamped with greater transparency and a lot more accountability. And I can promise you that the projects that we were able to fund are anything but wasteful spending. They are targeted funds for projects that specifically benefit our community's health, our community's wellness, education, our workforce development, our first responders, our infrastructure, and our economic development. In total, this past year, we received funding for 14 projects for a combined $10 million across our district. And so it's wonderful to have many of those folks who are recipients of this in, their, in our audience today. If you are with any of these organizations, as I call your name, or if you're with last year's organizations, please stand to be recognized. We have the Berks Latino Workforce Development Corporation. We have the LGBT Center for, of Reading. We have Alvernia uh, University, we have Westchester University, we have the Garage Community and Youth Center, we have Centro Hispano, we have LCH Health and Community Services, the Phoenixville Area Community Services, the Keystone Valley Fire Department, the Borough of West Grove, the United Way of Chester County, the City of Coatesville, Kennett Library, and the Reading Housing Authority. Please give these uh, serving leaders a round of applause. You. And really thank you for coming and thank you for the work that you do every day. And if you all are interested in more information about community project funding, because it's a very, very competitive process. We had 40 different groups apply this year and we were able to submit just about uh, two dozen or so. A little, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, about a dozen, 15 was the number. Um, and so please, if you're interested in learning more, please access our website because the process will start again. Under the new House administration, they have, are also committed to this community pro uh, project funding. So it will continue on in this, uh, in, this, um, in this Congress. And finally, last couple slides. I'm trying to get to your questions, but I really wanna make sure we talk about honoring our veterans. This is a picture of a really good guy. He's the secretary of the VA, Dennis McDonough. And I, I kind of called him out. I literally called him out. And I said, you need to come to my community. When Coatesville VA was on the list of uh, VAs that were going to be cl closed. And he came uh, and he saw and he listened. Uh, and I'm really excited to say that there was a lot going on here and I certainly won't take all the credit, but the Coatesville VA will not be closed. <laughs> happening in, in, uh, in that area of our community uh, and 
good things happening for our vets. We also were able to pass a, a, another piece of legislation call, called Honoring Our PACT Act. This is a huge piece of legislation that was signed into law that it has a huge expansion of benefits for a lot more veterans than were uh, previously included. For those who were exposed to toxic chemicals in burn pits, we were able to stop by the Coatesville VA Center during the holidays and share that news with many of our, of our veterans there. If you have questions, if you are a veteran and you want to know if you're newly uh, able to access these benefits, please uh, contact one of us on our team or access our website. And finally, national security. I'm not going to uh, belabor this, but national security is a really big deal. And um, what's happening in Ukraine is a really, really big deal. And you're going to be seeing some interesting conversations happening over the next weeks and months about the importance of continuing to support Ukraine. I would advocate that you continue, as I know you will, to support that democracy as it fights for not just the life of their nation, but for the lives of all of us. Because they are, where they go, we go. Um, China is watching, Iran is watching, everyone who has a, a bad interests is watching how we move and how our allies move and how we help and support Ukraine. And I would encourage you to listen to my now chairman, uh, Michael McCall, Republican, uh, who's the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, who over this weekend on um, the State of the Union said, there's gonna have to be a lot of educating going on in the next couple of weeks and months because we cannot afford to blink. We need to continue to support Ukraine. Um, so. <laughs> and last, as we lead into uh, our conversation with questions three minutes late, um, the best ideas come from you. Here's a picture with me with one of our constituents at a town hall in Morgantown. He was really concerned about reports that he had seen that the Chinese were buying oil purchased from our strategic petroleum reserve. I was really concerned to learn that too. I learned it from him. I immediately checked with my team and I learned that it was true. And quite clearly, this is not what our strategic petroleum reserve was intended for. And we can't continue this practice. In fact, I had previously written legislation that did something very similar with restricting the sale of rare earth elements and critical minerals um, from our stockpiles. So we literally lifted the language from that piece of legislation and slapped it down into a Banning Oil Exports and Foreign Adversaries Act. We found a Republican co-sponsor. We got more than 40 people to sponsor it on both sides of the aisle. I did my darndest to get that thing passed. It went through committee, but it didn't get passed on the floor because we ran out of time. We're gonna keep doing it again. This time we've got 60 uh, people who are sponsoring it right now. And this came from this gentleman. And finally, on the right, a very similar story, a tour of Paoli Hospital where I got to uh, meet an award-winning nurse, a doula actually, who talked to me about the supply of breast milk, uh, donor breast milk. And it's her ideas that we are executing on in the breast milk area. So that's it. That's um, my presentation. I apologize for being five minutes late. And I will, at this point, open for questions and answers. Thank you. You don't get any light on you? <laughs> you should shine a light on you. Am I good? Oh, there we go. Perfect. I, I have my flashlight, don't worry, just in case. <laughs> I can tell I'm getting older by how hard it is to read the questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, we'll start with questions around affordable housing. What can be done around affordable housing? Yes, and that's a huge issue in our area. Um, I think that we estimated that there should be as many as 30 additional affordable housing units built in our area, in Chester County specifically, and there is an equal demand up in the Berks County area. but because I serve, there are three members of Congress who serve Berks County, it's, it's a different conversation. Um, 30 places that would house as many as 30 people would be about what we are looking to do. Um, we have not had success, as much success as I'd like us to have in that area, but the American Rescue Plan has significant funding for housing affordability, as well as the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. One of the things that's really interesting about when you look at our area is Chester County in particular is very, very expensive. And we have a very, very low unemployment rate, but we have a very high number of jobs that are available. And a 
lot of people who would like very much to work in those jobs but can't afford to live in our area. So part of the solution is not just building affordable housing, but it's also to bring affordable housing to places like here or to places where they can access um, commutes, whether it's trains or buses. And that's why some of the work that our commissioners and our senators and, and everyone is doing to open up rail to places like Phoenixville, to places like Coatesville, to places like Reading, to be able to bring commuters into our area and out of our area is really important. And that helps on the affordability issue as well. That being said, we still very much need more affordable housing in our area. And some of the resources that are federally earmarked, so to speak, are for that purpose exactly. Thank you. The next question is about uh, Social Security. A number of states are not taxing Social Security. However, the federal government still is. Is there anything that can be done about that? This is going to be a really interesting conversation in the next couple of months, uh, up and until June, when we talk about um, the debt and what it is that we're going to be doing about that. I, what I would say to whomever asked this question is, I will look into the question that you were asking specifically on taxing at the federal level. I can't imagine that there's going to be the appetite for anything to be done on that right now, given the environment that we're in. But I would like to have a longer conversation with people about what's going to be happening uh, over the conversation about the debt limit. That's going to be a scary conversation. And what I would say to our audience is, these are bills that we already Bought, things we already bought, you know, we have to pay for the things that we already bought. They were bought under the Biden administration, they were bought under the Trump administration, they were bought under the Clinton administration, no, under the Bush administration. We have an obligation to service this debt. We also have an obligation to be more resourceful and to be um, more responsible to the taxpayers. Um, having come out of some extraordinary times, unprecedented times in the last several years, so those two conversations, in my opinion, need to be separated from one another and divorced from one another, and we can't hold one hostage to the other. And specifically when, and I know that the question is about taxing, and I, my short answer is I don't think it's gonna happen, but my longer answer is pay attention to Social Security, pay attention to Medicare, because we cannot afford to have those uh, be on the chopping block in exchange for a conversation about the debt. is about the post office. What are we doing to help support the post office and oh uh, get more resources? Yeah. I know exactly, literally, where this question likely came from. Um, I'm grateful for the question, and I'm grateful for the service of the postal workers who are here in this room, because, yeah. <laughs> because it's been a lot, you know. Um, I get, I was sharing with some of the members of our audience that my neighbor, in to my back, not exaggerating, sends me an email every week summarizing his, e his mailing delivery um, to his business so that I'm acutely aware of what's working and what's not working. Um, and I am acutely aware that we are really struggling, and particularly in Westchester, um, much of Chester County, and everywhere, frankly. Um, this is one of the things that I thought was really useful uh, in oversight. There's an oversight committee, you guys will probably hear a lot more about that too, but over the summer, the oversight committee came here, they came to Philadelphia to have what's called a field hearing, and a field hearing is exactly what it sounds like, it's like taking Washington to the people, and the field hearing was on the state of the post office. It's really bad. Um, we really aren't delivering mail in a timely way, and people are you know, losing prescription drugs and benefits and checks and all those other kinds of things. So the consequence of that field hearing was that there was going to be a um, um, inquiry into several postage offices in our area. One was not ours, so we raged against that for a while, and then we said we would settle down and wait for the results from those, um, from those reports. And Sue, I feel like that we got them just recently, or have they come? We got them just recently. Happy to share those with you guys. I'll post them up. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet, um, but I will post them up. Please know that we are really riding the post office hard. I know that there are personnel issues. I know that there are staffing issues. I know that there are, um, what do you call it, um, morale issues, um, and, and it's unacceptable. But it is something that, just like the uh, IRS, that you know needs modern systems and needs attention and needs not to be strangled on the vine which I think we've done pretty, uh, pretty badly in the last several years. Thank you. What can be done to increase support for mental health um, 
programs in our area and also expand access to mental health. This is something that comes up everywhere. It comes up with little little kids. I was just at um, a preschool in the co in, uh, where was it Oxford area, uh, West Grove, Oxford West Grove approximately. Um, that was um, really struggling with mental health issues with their babies, with their kids, and they were trying to figure out whether they should put forward a community funding project to help have a social worker be able to come in to take care of preschoolers that were struggling with issues that they were having. Same thing in our schools. The American Rescue Plan actually had significant funding to bring counselors back into our schools where they had been taken out because of funding decreases. The challenge is gonna be now that we're bringing them back into our schools, can we keep them there? Because this American Rescue Plan fund is temporary. It's not gonna, it's not gonna last forever. So we collectively have to recognize the importance of mental health um, care. I would also say the last place that I was at this last, um, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, Holcomb? Holcomb. Holcomb. Sorry, I always pronounce things wrong. I was at Holcomb on Friday, and we learned about their um, treatment centers and how they're, being, how they're supporting Chester County with their 988 and other kinds of things. Again, we need to continue to fund these, these kinds of things. We need to continue to put resources towards them. But the last part of the equation is the workforce. We don't have a workforce any longer to support the kinds of mental health uh, care and social work care that we need for our community. It's particularly acute for younger people because it doesn't pay as well. Um, and so this is why some of the legislation that I was sad that we weren't able to get through that has to do with honoring our uh, obligations to those who serve us who have debt um, is really, really important. If, if you're doing a job that is helping our economy, we need to help make it easier on you. And that means we have to do things to help make it more affordable. That means we have to do things to have, have you not be banging your heads against a wall when you're asking for a privilege, or, and, or, I mean, I'm sorry, for a right that you already are qualified for, which is loan forgiveness. Um, so I'll go back at that one. I will also go back at reintroducing some legislation that, that targets not just mental health um, professionals, but also, as I mentioned, social work, um, nurses. We are struggling for enough nurses, nurse practitioners, phys uh, physicians assistants, teachers. There's just a whole bunch of people that we need more of that we are um, not able to get. I'll give you last anecdote before I move on to the next question. I went to school. 35 years ago, I got a full scholarship from the ROTC. My scholarship required that I majored in industrial engineering. That was the needs of the Air Force. I had to major in industrial engineering. I left school debt-free, and my life has been a lot easier because of that. My roommate, for four years, came in. She wanted to be a teacher. She did not have the same kind of scholarships that I had, and she only recently finished paying her debts off. 35 years later, she has worked for three years in the Peace Corps and for the rest of the time on Native American reservations teaching English. This is not how we should treat our people, um, and we need to find ways to incentivize teachers to be able to teach. We have re uh, received a few questions on gun control, specifically assault weapons bans, and I also wanted to read this one specifically. We have a fifth grader in the audience who wrote, how can we ensure that our schools will be protected from school shootings? So I think it's a, hi, wherever you are out there. Thank you for coming. Um, hi. <laughs> I wish that I could say all the right things, you know? I wish that we could fix all of these issues. I wish that in some ways that we could, you know, um, be in New Zealand. But we are America, and um, we need to work together on all of the solutions. And that means that it needs to be focused on our, our safety through our first responders and our police. It needs to be focused on our safety with our schools and with our administrators and making sure that our, our school buildings are, are um, safer, and some of the American Rescue Plan money goes for those kinds of things too. Um, and it also means that we should have fewer guns on the street, a lot fewer guns on the street. And I know that some folks in the audience likely will not, I will not be popular with you for that statement, but that's okay. Um, I hope you heard other things that made you um, feel as though you're being well served. Thank you.
The next question is specifically about um, envir around environmental initiatives. Uh, what can be done, what incentives can be offered to large fleets uh, to electrify their fleets? And how can we expand electric vehicle uh, charging stations, et cetera, in our area? Yeah, we, there's lots. And in fact, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act um, is partly there. That's the half a loaf that I'm talking to you about. There are lots and lots of carrots in that piece of legislation. They are carrots that are incentivizing individuals, that are incentivizing large industries, mid-sized industries, and small industries to sort of do the right thing with, the con with their energy choices. Um, they, are, they are really cool, and that's why I highlighted it, re uh, revolutionary offers for the um, agriculture industry as well to be able to afford new equipment that is um, uh, not only modernized, it, in their operations, but also helping them have a lower carbon footprint. I got to visit a dairy farm and have a conversation about how important it is to invest in some of these equipments. And so um, I think the original question was asking, how are we doing it with big, bigger fleets? Um, a bunch of different ways. I had the chance to visit a company in our area that is developing what is what amounts to sort of like platforms in the ground that you can drive over and charge your car rather than having to plug in your car. The reasons that we would need those are huge, right? If I'm living in the city, which I do in Washington, D.C., you know, three weeks out of four, and I have my, my electric vehicle, which I do, I can't plug it in anywhere. And so, like, I'd have to have an extension cord coming out of my house. If I had a platform to be able to drive over and to charge, then that would help me. But it would be even better if I were a UPS fleet and I could drive all my UPS trucks up and roll up on that platform and charge them all in that one place. Um, and so some of the uh, programs here in the uh, Infrastructure and Jobs Act and what I hope will be subsequent pieces of legislation will incentivize people. Importantly, we're creating opportunities for people to be able to make choices with how they're, um, how they're using their fleets. I got the chance to visit UPS um, and UPS is still working really, really hard to get their first EV uh, fleet working. They've got, what they explained to me, I don't remember the, the order of magnitude, but like a lot of uh, trucks on back order that supply chains um, haven't yet come to them. And so a little bit of it is also a recognition that we are not quite there yet. We have to continue to work with the, uh, with the energy sources that we have as well. So that we, as much as I'd like UPS to roll with their fleet today, they can't. They would like to do that too. So we need to make sure that we're uh, working with all the different energy sources that we have to make it to a cleaner economy. Thank you. Is there any work being done in Congress about ethics in technology? <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of things going in my mind right now. I'm trying to figure out what kind of ethics and what kind of technology. Um, I'd like to maybe ha take that to follow up with whoever asked the question because I'm not sure what kind of tech you're talking about. Like, are you talking about Facebook or social media or are you talking about the stock market or are you talking about um, AI, um, the cyber issues? It's a big, big topic. Ethics in Congress is unfortunately not a very big topic. Um, <laughs> and I wish that it would be, um, a really big topic, but it is not. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the caucuses that you're on, the Women in STEM caucus and also the Problem Solvers Sure. Caucus. I'll start with the Problem Solvers caucus because we talked a little bit about STEM and STEAM, um, but the Problem Solvers caucus I really like. Um, it's a caucus, which is just a group of, of uh, members of Congress, and it's organized o over um, pragmatic problem solving. That's the name. Um, and it's organized as what's called a Noah's Ark Caucus. It means that you join by finding another member of the opposite party. And so I have to join with a Republican. He or she has to join with me. There are 56 members, so that's a pretty significant amount out of the 435 members of Congress. And we meet regularly, which is also not very common with caucuses. Caucuses sometimes are sort of like high school clubs that, you know, like pack your resume and you're, you know, applying to college and you're going like, I did all these things. This one we really work very hard on and the Problem Solvers Caucus really brought you much of what the Infrastructure and Jobs Act actually ended up looking like. The Problem Solvers Caucus had a working group 
uh, that was on infrastructure. They worked very, very hard with the Senate, brought it to the Senate, the Senate brought it to the White House, the White House brought it back to the Senate, and the Senate voted on it and dropped it back on us. So the problem solvers are working really hard to find those pragmatic solutions. We are also working on things which we haven't talked about, which is like immigration. Uh, comprehensive immigration reform is one of those third rails, you know, that's so hard to talk about, but so important. And there are so many good solutions just waiting for people to get together and have the harder conversations. Um, and so that's the Problem Solvers Caucus. Um, the Women in STEM and STEAM Caucus is 50 or so members strong, bipartisan as well. It was founded by two women from the Republican side and two women from the Democratic side, me included. And we caucus on being more inclusive in their STEM and STEAM, not just with women, but in all sorts of communities that are underserved or underrepresented. And it was founded two years ago, which is remarkable that a caucus such as this has not existed until two years ago. Um, and I think that's a tribute to having more diversity in Congress. How, uh, how can we work together to overcome partisanship? <laughs> I try really, really hard. I'll give you another good example. Um, tomorrow morning I head down to Washington for the rest of the week. I'm working with a, a newer member of Congress named Stephanie Bice. She's a Republican from Oklahoma. She actually beat a really good friend of mine. But she's a really good person. And so I've worked with her now on a bunch of things. Uh, specifically, I'm working with her on paid parental leave programs. And so I hope you'll see a little bit more of that in the next week's news cycle because we're having one of our first organizing meetings and um, we have organized a group of five of us who are starting this, uh, two Republicans, three Democrats, to try to find common ground on, on parental leave. We're also working together on uh, a number of other issues that have to do with fertility. And this is interesting because the way that we met each other is on the Armed Services Committee. And um, so it's that kind of thing. It's the one-off relationships that you try to foster and nurture because the place is nutty and the place really encourages you not to, not to get along. Um, it's, it's endemic, um, but it's really important that we do. And so as an example, when, um, when we did the vote on January, I guess it was 6th or the morning of January 7th, and many, many of my colleagues did not vote to support the results of the election. It was enormously, enormously disappointing to me. But I have to work with everyone. I have to serve everyone here, and I have to work with everyone here. So one of the people I work with a lot is Mr. Jim Baird, who did not vote to certify the election results uh, from Indiana, but he's a fellow vet. Uh, and he's got some really interesting ideas in STEM and STEAM, and particularly with women and girls, and I will work with him because it needs to be done. Um, so that's how we will do it. We have a number of questions about restoring faith in government. Uh, one question specifically, what can residents do to help um, further prevent the erosion of the faith in our government, especially when it comes to voting in elections? Vote. Um, tell other people to do it and, and educate ourselves, you know, who we're voting for. And uh, don't just, like, literally read the book by its cover. Like, dive deep and, and try to figure out, you know, I had a conversation with a lady over a pumpkin like, two years ago. <laughs> and she said, I'm a small business owner. And, you know, um, she said, when she discovered that I was her representative, she said, what are you? A D or an R, and I was like, well, let me describe, you know, who I am. I'm a vet. I'm an engineer. I'm a business person. I'm an educator. What do you think I am? And and she was like, well, I'm a Republican. I was like, that's good. You know, that's okay. She said, do you mind? I'm like, no, I don't. Like, we have to have these conversations. My my family are all Republicans. Um, we have to have these conversations, and that's what each and every one of us has a responsibility to do. Is have a conversation at Thanksgiving or with your friends or whatever, and, and go outside of your social media circles and really talk to people, um, and that you're doing it, you're here. Um, and hopefully, you know, I know that out there, there are people who are not agreeing with the things I'm saying, and that's okay. Um, I'm doing my best to represent and serve us all, and I know that you are a patriot, and you are also doing your best uh, with, with everything that you're bringing to this conversation. Thank you. Can you, can you give us um, some information about the January 6th uh, committee? 
Yes, I would very much encourage you to read the report. Um, here's a disappointing fact. First of all, it's really long. So only read the executive summary, which I think is like, I read only 50 pages so far. I'm still working on it. I think it's 200 pages long. My dad read all of it. And he gave me the highlighted version of every page of it so I have the opportunity to read his highlights. Um, but what I would say is the executive summary alone is really worth the read. I will continue to slog through it as I'm able to. Um, I was overseas, and I'll tell this story because it's important. I was overseas on a bipartisan delegation with a member who I very much admire, roughly speaking around when a Republican, when this report came out. And one of my colleagues asked um, our staff members if they would print out a copy for her to read of this on the plane. And he said, don't bother printing one out for me. And it's really disappointing because it's our job. Our job is to you know, read these things. And so what I can tell you is read it, or at least read the executive summary, because it's really remarkable. And the people who worked on that committee were, were, were real, true patriots and really did you know, put their jobs in one of I will, I will tell you that Liz Cheney has become a good friend of mine as a consequence of, of this. We have very little in common, but I really admire what she did over the course of uh, the last couple years with that. Can you give us a little information on immigration specifically in ways that it could help our workforce? We need more people here to do the jobs that are here. We don't have enough people. My dad was a refugee. He came here, he survived the Holocaust. He came here as a five-year-old. Um, he just turned 81. And um, he came here to this country with his single mom having survived a horror um, and was able to, a generation later, you know, serve 30 years in the Navy and raise a great family and really participate in our economy in a very remarkable way. And he has a cute daughter, too. Um, but, but seriously, like, our economy and our, and our nation demands that we still have room for the five-year-old with nothing. Our economy and our nation also demands that we have room and the ability to create pathways for people who bring skills to this country, because we need those too. You know, whether we're talking to the folks, you know, who are high tech providers or pharmaceutical providers in our, in our community, or we're talking to the mushroom farmers, everyone is desperate for somebody to knock the heads together and just come up with a solution that allows for there to be a little bit of a loosening on how it is that we manage our immigration. I'm not going to lie, I had the chance to go down to the, to the border, and we really do have a lot of work to do there, a ton of work to do. Uh, but I also think a bunch of it is a little bit like um, when we talk about the IRS, it's, it's structural, it's procedural, it's you know, resource intensive, it's making everybody on it, both sides is working very, very hard to, to, do, to do the right things, but we're just not providing the resources that we need to to do that. But we also need to simultaneously solve for the fact that we can't get people to work mushroom farms here and we can't get people to work at QVC. Um, who have the tech uh, t skills that we need. And I believe that there has been an opportunity to, to pass legislation two or three times, not since I've been in Congress, but hopefully it'll, the, that opportunity will happen again. Thank you, and this is our last question. With all of the challenges before you, why should we still have hope? <laughs> <laughs> we have to have hope. Um, I genuinely believe in this nation. I believe we are the best nation in the world, and I believe we lead. Uh, and I believe that we lead with each and every one of the individuals who are in this room and in our community and in our commonwealth and in our country. I think the only way, uh, my dad, when he was in the military, would inevitably get assigned a job and we'd have a conversation at the table and there would be some you know, conversation of, you can only fix things if you're there, right? You can't, you gotta show up. So you can't just sit there and say, you know what, I'm out. I don't want to work for that guy. I don't want to do that thing. I don't want to, like, we have to solve for these problems now. Because this is, uh, I, I think, who said the thing like about America about democracy? It's, it's the worst thing, uh, Churchill, I think it was. The worst thing, except for all the other op options or something like that. <laughs> um, I'm not a historian, as you can tell. <laughs> 
Thank you for the really, really good questions. Um, and as I mentioned, for whatever cards that we were not able to get to, or for individual specific things, because I had some conversations up in the back with specific case casework, um, we'll be happy to uh, reach out. I would like to acknowledge my team who is here. Please raise your hand if you're here. I have, I think, gosh, a lot of us here. Nine and ten. And so thank you. I think with that, I will go to our closing remarks. We have eight minutes left. Yes, I can do that. Okay, so here are the closing remarks. I told you there would be some, some um, children's storybooks involved in this conversation. I sometimes call our community a purple place when I'm down in Washington, D.C., and I do that because we are a purple place. We are one of the very few, and there's only a couple dozen, uh, districts, congressional districts that really have a good balance of R, D, and I. Something around 40, 40, 20, um, which is really remarkable. And as I mentioned, there's really only a couple dozen uh, communities like that. And so that's why I call it the purple place, neither red nor blue, but something in between. And I'm really, really proud of our country and this area and what we've achieved. But please know that we have a lot of work still to do. And make no mistake, the legislation from the 117th Congress will continue to positively change lives and livelihoods for years to come. So all of these things that I highlighted for you, the five or six bills, major, major pieces of legislation that passed, the, the floodgates of resources and ideas and legislation does not just drop on us uh, instantly. It takes a while to work through the pipeline. And so you'll start seeing the, the fruits of all of the labor soon uh, in our communities. Um, it is really a, a genuine uh, honor to serve you. I am grateful for the recognition that we have had as an office in, in our commitment for accountability and transparency and to uphold those values and principles, uh, civility and decency and ethics that I think are really, really important in this challenging time for our democracy. This answers your question. I believe in our government and I believe in this country and across the miles from our opportunities coast to coast and all levels, I believe that federal, state, and local, and all of us have to work together. And that's just not in Washington, and that's just not in people who are elected, but it needs to be we, it needs to be all of us to be able to take this on. So when I talk to people about purpleness, I talk, uh, I remember the story of Harold and the Purple Crayon. Good one, right? Love that one. Read it if you haven't had a chance. Harold has his purple crayon, and he goes around town drawing and solving problems with his purple crayon. And he encounters all these ideas and solutions along his way. And so I believe that we are all Harold with our purple crayon. So it's not enough for us to serve both uh, as a government. We all have to serve, and we all have to extend a hand. Uh, Next really weird um, analogy I'm gonna bring you to is Sesame Street. For those of all of us who are of a certain age and Mr. Rogers and Zoom and all of those favorite shows that we had. Um, as an adult, looking back on those shows, I really learned a lot of lessons from these early childhood entertainments. Recall for many of us when we only had two or three channels and PBS to watch. But we learned about things like cooperation and inclusion and innovation, and we learned those frequent themes over and over again. And one of those frequent themes is being a helper. Pennsylvania, as many of you guys remember, credits Fred Rogers as one of our own, and he has this advice. He always said, in times of trouble and uncertainty, look for the helpers. If you look around, you will always find someone willing to help. And I think this is remarkably good advice to this day. This is where it gets weird, because this is when I put Mr. Rogers together with the military. <laughs> Mr. Rogers was the ultimate force multiplier. And in the military, force multiplier is when you, you know, take one thing and, and it, it, it scales, it grows, it expands to be able to be something much larger because of the one thing that you did. So fortunately for all of us, he's um, not just a force multiplier, but he's a pretty darn good helper and we need more of them. So in the next slide, our final slide, I'd like to show you a couple force multipliers. In December, I had the chance to meet some wonderful students from Coatesville, from Coatesville School High School. This is Jabari Stalker and Jonathan Rivera. They are classmates and football teammates. Jonathan is asthmatic, and one day during history class, he inadvertently, get this, inhaled a portion of his asthma inhaler. And Jabari, 
knowing what had happened, jumped up and immediately administered the Heimlich maneuver, and he saved his friend, who was choking and struggling to breathe. So this is the helpers, right? Our community never ceases to inspire me, and with Jonathan and Jabari in mind, my office and I have started a new program, which is sort of a little cheesy, that we're calling the Hula Helpers. And <laughs> next slide, please. Last week, it was a privilege to recognize these two remarkable ladies from the Kendall community, Irene Kalman and Ann Humes, who I think are 104 and 95 years old. And they knit dozens of sweaters and scarves for the children at the TikTok Early Learning Childhood Center, the name I couldn't remember. I was able to present Irene and Ann with a congressional commendation from our office as the very first school of helpers, and I'm grateful that we had the chance to acknowledge them for their kindness as well. And so my, my final conclusion is that we, my team and I, will very much continue to look for more hula helpers. Let us know if you know one. Um, I encourage all of us to look for the good in each other and to be force multipliers. Uh, please be kind and please stay well. And thanks very much for spending your evening with us. Good night.